Your Royal Highness, my Lords, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, another year passes and I welcome the opportunity as Minister for Rural Affairs and Biosecurity to update uh, the forum and indeed on what has been achieved. Uh, it's appropriate perhaps I should declare my membership of the British Horse Society. I host a point point on the family farm at Kimball and indeed someone who has admired and loved the horse for so much of my life. So there is no flannel when I say you in this room are internationally recognized as a leading source of equine expertise. The equine makes a significant contribution to our economy, is worth more than eight billion pounds a year, with bloodstock, breeding, racing, and equestrianism more generally. Overseas trade valued at more than 400 million pounds, and indeed the second largest rural employer. Yet I'm sure all of us would want to record that the horse means to us something which is surely also without price. And I think an uplifting example of the importance of the horse is the inspirational work of the Riding for the Disabled and its focus on horses, health and happiness. And I think with the RDA in its 50th year and alongside the British Equestrian Federation has highlighted the dual benefit that volunteering has in helping transform the lives of their 18,000 volunteers and the 25,600 disabled children and adults they serve. And I'm very pleased that uh, their chief executive officer, Ed Brasher, is going to be part of this afternoon's uh, occasion. Once again, I think that today's agenda will be an absorbing one, and clearly we need to thank, as I do, volunteers, and all including Georgina Crossman, who works tirelessly to ensure the National Equine Forum is the go-to event, led ably by Tim Brigstock. Indeed, uh, reading Horse and Hound last night, I read it was a sellout. Equine health and welfare remains absolutely central to the work of all of us here today. As minister responsible for animal health, I of course take all equine matters very seriously. So what has been done? During this last year, we've updated the horse code, the statutory code of practice for the welfare of horses, ponies, donkeys, and their hybrids. And my thanks go to the British Horse Council for all their input into this. Turning to the licensing of riding schools, for the first time now makes a direct link to the minimum standards of welfare in the Animal Welfare Act of 2006. And again, I'm grateful to the British Horse Council and the British Horse Society for their support, particularly on the drafting of the guidance. And I also look forward to hearing views on the licensing of animal sanctuaries and rescue centres. Turning to One Health and antimicrobial resistance, DEFRA and the animal health sector is showing its leadership in the global initiative of One Health. The government is working together to mitigate the risks of existing and emerging zoonotic diseases and the rising threat of antimicrobial resistance. Last year, across the animal health sector, the UK was able to announce a 40% reduction in the use of antibiotics. In December, I led a de delegation with the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Veterinary Officer in Washington to advance international support for research and further strategies. In January, the government launched its new five-year national action plan and a 20-year vision to tackle antimicrobial resistance in health, animals, the environment, and the food chain. The government recognizes the great work of vets working with horse owners to reduce further antibiotic use. Indeed, our objectives overall for all animals by 25% between 2016 and 2020, with objectives to be refreshed in 2021. Clearly, much more work needs to be done. But it is important also 
to record the progress that is already evident. Equine flu, many here in this room uh, were affected and working on this, and I followed this as Minister for Biosecurity with the greatest interest. And I recognize the pragmatism, expertise, and hard work of the British Horse Racing Association, the Animal Health Trust, National Trainers Federation, and other members of the Equine Disease Coalition. Advice is still to vaccinate as the best protection against infection and to consider booster vaccinations for horses last vaccinated more than six months ago. I know there's going to be a review following the outbreak and I will want to, want to follow those results, but I'm sure we would all agree, wherever it is from ho at home and abroad, we should surely place biosecurity as of the greatest importance. Turning to equine identification, and my memories of being here before is that this is a matter that has engaged the forum. I do want to thank everyone here for this considerable advance. New ID regulations are already in force in England with the devolved administrations following suit. UK-wide regulation last week cleared Parliament in order to make the necessary technical changes to retained EU legislation so that equine records movements and identification remains operable upon the UK leaving the EU. Indeed, these last few weeks, I've taken through statutory instruments on vets, farriers, veterinary medicines, and animal welfare. Again, new animal breeding regulations applied from November. These simplify and streamline the standards for breeders and stud books. We have made sure that the improvements you in this room and beyond have sought are reflected in the regulations. By 2020, all British equines will require a microchip. This ensures there are no gaps in our system of identification. Exception is made for semi-wild ponies. But local authorities now have modern enforcement powers in the form of civil sanctions and cost recovery. Rules around transfer of ownership have been tightened. But as I've said, we continue, and I think this is important, we continue to recognize the unique heritage of our semi-wild pony populations. Minimum operating procedures for passport issuing organizations have been revised and updated and indeed are kept under constant review. So far as the central equine database is concerned, the UK's 65 passport issuing organizations are making tens of thousands of updates each month to the central equine database on behalf of the UK's 1.3 million equines and their 650,000 owners. The vast majority of passport issuing organizations' updates are made within the statutory limit of 24 hours, which is far faster than the original EU requirement. It is now easier to tell which organizations are meeting their obligations to CED as well as, I may say, any that might warrant a closer look in the coming months. The CED's growing list of users includes 586 from local authorities, 181 from passport issuing organisations, and 40 from the Food Standards Agency. Together, we are using the CED to ensure robust identification, welfare, food safety, and enforcement and support. The CED is the start of the journey offered by embracing better technology and information management. Stuart Everett from Equine Register will shortly talk about the digital stable and developments with smart cards supported and enabled by our regulations and policy approach. I could have simply never invented any of this, yet we must surely all grasp the opportunities of this technology. We in the UK are now leading on this, for example, with the Livestock Information Programme. And I'm most grateful for the effort and influence of Jeanette Allen and Jan Rogers and their continued and strong role in the Traceability Design User Group. In case any of you thought that 
I was going to avoid the B word. I should say that, of course, we have a session uh, following this with Pamela Thompson, the Deputy Director for Portfolio and Preparedness in DEFRA, who has been leading our preparation for EU exit with regard to equines. But I do want to say that I, rec I, I recognise the equine sector's constructive and positive approach in managing change as we look to the future challenges and indeed opportunities. And in particular, I recalled the knowledge and experience of the British Horse Council and the thoroughbred sector, and indeed our close working as we leave the EU will be ever more important. But surely, Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, all of this hard work and progress is about one thing, preserving the very special place equines have in our society, our economy, and our lives. By working together, the equine world and government can continue to lead in equine expertise, innovation, advances in health and welfare, and future opportunities. We in the United Kingdom, I believe, have a very proud record. We have strived over many years for success at amateur and professional levels in pursuit of the many elements of equestrianism. But to me, the well-being of the horse will always be paramount. Thank you.